Hey, Daniel from GrowYourMusicStudio.com here. And in this video, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, something that's very important to me, something that has helped my business. And as the title of this video indicates, something that helped my personal studio and Grow Your Music Studio immensely in terms of uh, the lack of stress that I had around the business and more importantly, the financial results that the business produced. And I'm joined by Alyssa, a colleague of mine, who runs a uh, premium lesson program in one of the more competitive cities on the East Coast, Boston. Hey, Alyssa, what's up? How are you? Hi, Daniel. How you doing? Yeah, doing well. And in just a second, I want Alyssa to uh, jump in here and give a little bit more of a detailed introduction, but I want to quickly uh, reveal what the topic of this video is and, and why we're making this video. So we recently at Grow ran an internal customer survey. Grow has served over 600 studios around the world. And we did an internal survey and asked a simple question. What do you think about business coaching? And we asked a couple questions around this. And what was fascinating to me and why I brought Alyssa, and again, in just a second, she's going to, I'm going to kind of reveal more why she's here for this. Um, what was so fascinating to me was the questions that people had about what it is, whether it would work for them, whether they were worthy enough to use business coaching, whether it be a waste of time for them, skepticism. There was just a lot of misconceptions and questions that I thought doing a video like this could be very, very helpful because I am a huge believer in business coaching. It has helped me immensely. I'm gonna get a little bit, um, I'm gonna get into that a little bit more as we go through this video, but I don't wanna uh, reveal all my cards yet. I think this is a good place, Alyssa, for me to volley it over to you um, because Alyssa is also a business coach. She's also a music coach. I don't want to steal your thunder, Alyssa. So maybe take one, two minutes and um, give me the high level overview of Musicians Playground and the kinds of programs that uh, you, you all offer and, and um, maybe the unique perspective you take on how you view your teaching staff. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, sure. Well, it's great to be here, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk about this very important concept of why coaching is such a great idea for all of us who are looking to grow. Um, Musicians Playground is located in downtown Boston, and it's a company that I founded back in 2012. The first few years were a lot more relaxed than uh, the last few have been, but we are currently uh, in this beautiful space here, 3,000 square feet, where we provide music-loving adults and families with lessons. Uh, our model of business is very similar to a gym, but for musicians. So we have a range of learning opportunities, uh, group class programs, one-on-one -on -one training or private lessons, as well as the option for members to utilize our space for open practice. Mm. Um, and then outside of that, we, in the past couple of years, have recently expanded to uh, co-creative rental opportunities. So we host a variety of, of creative uh, professionals ranging from photographers, to videographers, uh, to even a, a events for corporations here at the space, as well as team building events for corporations. So wow. um, definitely have grown our, our space as just a creative platform for a lot of different uses throughout the years. And it's been nothing short of an, of an adventure doing that. No doubt. No doubt. Um, so what I would love to talk about with you today, just given the unique perspective you have, the, 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 the big business that you've built there um, and uh, has to do with just one of the main things that I saw in that internal survey that we did. And that was the questions and skepticism around what business coaching is, why it's useful, um, what does good coaching look like? What is coaching not, what is it? I want to start with a little bit of a story, and then and then I have a question for you, Alyssa. Um, so, nearly a decade ago, I had purchased this marketing training um, from a marketing mentor of mine that I greatly respect. I still very much this day follow what he has to say. And as part of their customer service, they had one of their business coaches reach out to me, or one of their customer service people reach out to me. And they asked me about my business and I kind of told them about my studio. At that time, my studio was doing really well. Um, my, you know, I was bringing home over six figures just from a small single teacher studio because of the group lesson program that I was in. And they kind of looked and saw like, oh, I think we should probably try to upsell this guy to like a higher level program. They didn't say that to me, obviously, but 
Now, I could tell the, the subtext of what was going on. So they connected me to one of their business coaches. I had one conversation with this guy. And in the course of that conversation, he asked me a lot about the business, asked me a lot of questions about like our numbers and our metrics and these sorts of things. And I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of everything we talked about. I think that'd be boring for everyone. But I want to get to the result. I had one conversation with this guy. And three months later, my studio was making 33% more in terms of revenue. And that was almost all straight profit. It wasn't like, you know, I spent a million dollars to make a hundred thousand. You know what I mean? Like it was almost all straight profit. And I look at that outcome and I look at what this guy had me do. And I want to reveal a little bit more what it was he actually said to me, because I'm sure people are like, well, tell me, I want to make 33% more. Do you want to make 33% more, Alyssa? Like, that sounds good, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe we'll get into that in just a second. But I, I think the details are of that at this juncture of the conversation are less important than the fact that it was literally one conversation that I had with him. And it led to this outcome that I could very clearly connect. I would not have done that set of actions had that guy not asked me those questions and told me to do that thing and defeated those, you know, A, B, C objections that I had to what he was saying. Okay. Um, so this is where I want to jump into maybe the first question that we both can answer. And that is, and I'm going to answer first. And Alyssa, I would love to hear what you have to say about this. I know uh, I'm talking a little bit too much here, so I definitely <laughs> want to get over to you in just a second. But um, I think the first thing is, why should someone work with a business coach? Why would that even be valuable? Now, since we both have been the beneficiaries of it, I think we can speak to that. But I do want to acknowledge that we both are business coaches. So there could be a little bit of um, uh, rose-colored glasses that we're wearing. So what I want to be very aware of in this conversation is speaking in practical ways. That this isn't just me as a business coach saying like, oh, here's why you should have one. I want to focus more on how it has helped me not theoretical ideas about why I think it's a good idea. And so here's where I want to start. And that is, if someone asked me that question, the gut reaction I would have is to get where you're going faster. And um, what I mean by that is every time that I have identified a goal that I wanted to get to, and that it was meaningful enough that I wanted to get to it, I have found that by bringing in an outside perspective, especially someone who is trained to understand uh, the human mind and, and business, you know, those two things together are kind of a psychological component, a business component. I have always, or nearly always, uh, arrived at those goals faster. And I, I have some stories I can back that up. I think what I mentioned a few minutes ago certainly goes into that, but um, Maybe let me let me back off the gas here for just a second and, and volley this over to you, Alyssa. When you hear that question, why should you work with a business coach? Gut reaction, wake up at three o'clock in the morning, you know, bolt upright in bed. Like, what's your gut reaction to that, to that question? Yeah, so I think that we are existing in a current day of information overload. And what I mean by that is there are so many different platforms we can self-learn and resources made available to us through the internet uh, and other digital methods. And there are a lot of uh, people who have had a lot of valuable experiences and, and meaningful advice to share. The problem that we're in is that that immense amount of information costs a lot of time to sort through and to understand what's most relevant or meaningful for us and our unique situations and in, in our careers or in our lives. So I think the value of a coach is that they can almost be your chief strategy officer and mm. understanding the information that's out there and helping you choose the best, uh, the, the best way to accomplish your goals, utilizing that information. Um, mm. So yes, and, and that notion, I agree, they can help you go faster uh, toward your goals, but also the additional perspective they share can also widen, I believe, the perspectives that we hold. And I think you were alluding to that too. Sometimes just by nature of a coach sharing their wider perspective based on their own life experiences and challenges that they've found solutions for, um, we're able to then come up with our own new ideas for our own situations. And so I just think between 
uh, their ability to uh, have those perspectives and experiences that, that are different than our own often be further along in the journey or the direction of which we're looking to go and their understanding of the information that's out there and how we can utilize it most efficiently. That's why we choose to work with a coach. Hmm. Okay. Now I agree. I have a question for you to follow up on that. And this isn't necessarily a challenge for me, uh, but one of the things that I saw more than once in that internal survey was people who had worked previously with a coach of some sort. And they said that they felt as if uh, the coach gave them stories about their experience, the coach's experience, and, and what their what they kind of picked up from the coach was, hey, here's what I did. Now kind of figure out how to apply that to your situation. That was kind of one of the frustrations that I, that, that I noticed that people brought up more than once. I thought that was interesting that there was kind of this, um, so the story is important. I completely agree with you. I'm curious what you say to that though. Like what, what would be your perspective about, you know, what I just forwarded there to you? Um, this idea that, that, uh, perhaps the complaint that, oh, my coach just told me a bunch of stories. What do you think about that? Well, without being there, it's hard, yes. to, hard, hard to speculate. And, <laughs> and maybe we can volley back and forth a little bit on that. But yeah, I, I'm curious if anything, even just kind of gut reaction comes to mind for you. If I were to make a presumption, it might be, mm. it might be that one, potentially the coach is actually performing more role of a consultant. Um, hmm. And I do want to make a differentiation between what I believe to be a coach versus a consultant. So a consultant is someone who we hire to figure out a very specific problem in a specific way. And often we're relying on them to completely source the solution versus a coach helps us to model or put out a framework of solving problems on our own. So 100% could be a, just a misalignment of the person who's seeking coaching, uh, finding a consultant and vice versa. And hmm. some, sometimes we just need a mix of both in one person. We need a unicorn, hmm. if you will. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's where I believe it comes down to a coach client fit and you know, being selective on and working with someone who we feel serves us on all of the levels that are important to us and someone who we're taking guidance from. Can I jump in there? Yeah, please, please. Because I have worked with both. Several years ago, I worked with a guy, I paid $3,500 to work with him for one month for him to, him and his team to teach me a very specific set of principles and systems that I installed in my business. And they did some work for me and I talked to him one time and I talked to his team, you know, more than I talked to him. And I, direct, I again, just like that coach from nearly a decade ago, I could clearly see the results of that. I would say it was more consulting. It had more to do with something I wanted to learn about in terms of business, and then a set of actions that I needed to learn how to perform in the business so that I could expand. Whereas, and, and I'm gonna kind of piggyback on what you said, a coach, what I think a good coach does, and I'm maybe even barring against the next question I'm gonna ask is, helps you kind of to see the effects of your own thinking. I'm gonna tell a little bit of a story here mm. because again, mm. in what I saw people having skepticism about coaching, uh, I think the worry is, are they just gonna weigh me down with a bunch of stuff to do? Or are they just gonna teach mm. me for an hour while I'm on the phone or Zoom with them? I'm gonna give an example of like you know, straight from a coaching session of mine. And, and I don't know, I'm, <laughs> while I tell this, Alyssa, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna warn you, like maybe you could give me an example of, of what you just said there, I'm um, here in just a minute or two. I, I would be curious to know where you felt the difference. Um, but I had this anxiety early on in the early days of Grove, like, oh, I know that I should be doing videos. Mm -hmm. But all I was doing was writing blog posts for like the first 18 months. If you go back, you'll see those first two years, I wrote a lot of blog posts and then I haven't written a lot since then because we've kind of gone mm -hmm. more to video. Um, I knew I needed to, and I wasn't. And so I brought this up to, the co to my coach who I worked with for a very, very long time. I, it's been a while since I've worked with him. I've worked with other folks since then. And um, 
what did he tell me to do? What, what, what did I get on, on Zoom or the phone with him? Did he like give me, oh, here's how you make a great video. Here's how to make a video persuasive. Here's how to get to rank on YouTube. No, this is what it was. Dave, I know I should be doing video and I'm not. And his first question to me was, why should you be doing video? <laughs> and so I started telling him and, and then I started getting into all the reasons why I didn't think I should be doing video. And the assignment I got from him at the end, and you can go back and check our records because you, you'll see this happen. What the assignment I got from him at the end was not what I would call the great coaching. I think it was the result of great coaching. I'm going to explain what I think the great coaching was here in just a second. But the assignment I got from him at the end of that call was, I want you to do a video, I think three videos a week for the next quarter. This was nearly the end of December of, I think it was 2017. And I, and I did. In fact, I actually was a little bit ahead, I think. So I, I ended the quarter early. I think I did like 24 videos in 75 days. Um, now this sounds dangerously like some of the complaints that people have. Oh, they, I'm already so busy. They're just gonna give me more stuff to do. That wasn't it. What we did for most of that hour was I explained to him in great detail why I didn't think I could do it. And he, without ego, with curiosity, with levity, showed me the results of my own thinking. And I was stuck and he, and he very, I hate to use this word, but I'm gonna use it anyway. He gently showed me exactly what I was thinking that was keeping me from doing that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna get all the technical details of, of, again, what we talked about in that call because it was only existing in my head. Someone else probably would have had different things. And what I know to be true of Dave and, and why he's a great coach and, and what I seek to embody in my coaching is it's less about the assignment and more about how is this person in front of me stuck? And how can I, and like you said, Alyssa, how can I unlock their, to use some spiritual language here, their inner wisdom? How can I unlock or how can I help remove obstacles from this person so that they can move forward in what they need to do? Now, how this could apply to someone, you know, watching or listening here would be, Maybe you know you need to raise rates in your studio, but you're not doing it yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know you need to make a premium program. You haven't done it yet. There's things we know we should do. Mm -hmm. More than likely, the reason you're do not doing it isn't because you don't have enough information. There's something going on in here. And what a great coach does is figures out what's going on up here and helps empower you to do the things that you quote unquote know you should be doing already. I'm curious yeah. what you think about that, uh, Alyssa, and maybe what your experience has been around this. Oh, wow. That was such a great, a great story. Um, and I, I feel like that's such a real, such a real struggle for so many of us. Mm. Um, I would say a good coach not only addresses what's up here, but also in our heart space too, mm. um, that they're, you know, mind, body, spirit, it's all connected. And I find that I've worked with a variety of different coaches who have had um, different specialties, if you will. And all of them have holistically come together to give me tools that I've needed to be the coach I am and, and impart the wisdom that I impart upon my own clients and my own staff that I work with and train. So um, I, I think that those tools are so incredibly important and, and having a variety of those experiences with a variety of coaches that I have had, because mm. uh, sometimes you're right. It's not just the strategy in business. Like it's not just making a decision about, I need to take this action toward this revenue goal that I have. Sometimes it's the person that has that goal that needs to be addressed. And uh, for example, raising rates, you know, maybe behind a reluctance to raise rates is actually a feeling of unworthiness in that person that's deeply rooted in a subconscious belief or experience that needs to be explored in a safe environment, right? So that would be a role that someone who, who serves as more of a holistic coach would be more helpful than someone who is strictly consultant around strategizing business or making decisions toward accomplishing uh, very objective goals toward the business. So um, yeah, I can say that I've had, uh, you know, personal experiences that I, mm. I have, I have actually, you know, felt frustrated and also felt completely surprised by the, the results that I've taken from working with various people. Um, 
for example, I've engaged a spiritual coach who I work with. She's a spiritual psychologist. And I, I like mm. to think of her as my, uh, as my uh, therapist in certain ways, but also it's just, she addresses again, my, my mind space, my heart space, my whole self that I bring to my business and to my people and to my life. And uh, I, I went into that thinking I was gonna use her to solve a very specific issue. And it's funny because the things that I learned with her, I'm able to apply even in the business, right? It's all transferable. It's, it's allowed me to show up as an even better and fuller version of myself in a variety of business uh, experiences. And then I've worked with business coaches that uh, that I have felt frustrated with because actually they weren't able to treat that wholeness. Uh, mm. And that was really what needed treating. Uh, and I would leave with the same frustrations of working with them because that wasn't actually what I was looking for, right? So I think that the value of working with a coach who's had a variety of coaching experiences, who's reached a level of success that we're looking to reach is that um, hopefully they come with that very interesting blend of experiences and having worked with others themselves and they're more in tune to, oh, this is not a business problem. This is a people problem or a person problem, right? Or vice versa. So yeah, so I would agree with you. And I think your story was just an excellent way of portraying that. And you actually touched on one of my mottos. And that is that we do not have business. I've said this before. It's actually on record with a podcast that I did two years ago <laughs> um, with, where they were interviewing me, where I said, we, uh, we don't have business problems. We have us problems that are showing up in our business in <laughs> right. almost every case where um my business has made massive jumps forward it's been as i've addressed things here and and got out of my own way almost every case you know there's some things where it literally was just a technical thing like i learned that thing i implemented it it was purely technical yes. i think everybody knows that i've beat on this drum for five years but google ads like that was life-changing for me but I wasn't going to google me like google solve my spiritual problem no that was purely technical and and that's great but but some of the deeper stuff that got addressed like you know childhood att attitudes that I'd carried from child about um, childhood about money um mm -hmm. fears that I had things like that as those things got addressed and I became a calmer more patient person um I've just seen you know the line on the graph go up as a result yeah. of dealing with those things. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna jump into what good coaching is, but I think there is a lot of question and skepticism around it. And so before I jump there, I actually want to address a few things first. What great coaching is not. And I think we might have an interesting discussion around this um, because, and, and I think we both alluded to it it already in the conversation. So we might not have to spend a lot of time here, but one of the things that uh, really stood out to me um, but in some of the coaches that I have worked with, because I've had coaches where, you know, I paid three to $500 a month to work with them. I had a coach, I literally was paying three grand a month to work with for a year. What was the difference between those two experiences? Um, and, and what I would say is that for those, I don't want to say lower level coaches, but for those coaches, you know, that were on the lower end of that range, I think they were more like, they fit more of that profile of a consultant. They were doing a lot more talking. They were doing a lot more teaching. Um, in some cases, I really felt as if I wasn't even being, I was being heard, but mm -hmm. I could tell just after a while, I could tell that they already had an answer for me before I even mentioned the problem. And so that coaching looked a little bit more like teaching. Like, hey, go do mm -hmm. this, Daniel. Here's a list of 86 things for you to do between now and the next call. Good luck, right? Whereas, um, and I've given a lot of examples of, uh, of my, kind of my own coaching. Maybe I'll go more towards a client of mine in the, from the past where it's not about teaching sometimes. Um, and, and, I mean, Alyssa, do you mind if I tell a little bit of another story here? No, please. And, and please. by the way, jump in and challenge me whenever you, like if you want me to like go deeper on something, if you, you know, just jump in there, like, uh, you know, challenge or just ask an additional question. I should have said that at the outset, but, um, cause I certainly done that to you already. But there, I think this is a perfect example of if you have a prepackaged solution 
um, as a coach, you might not be serving your client as well as you could. And here's what I mean. I worked with a woman on the West Coast three years ago. And she was, uh, you know what? There, it's such a big city. No one is ever going to know who this is. It was in San Francisco. She was in downtown San Francisco and she wanted to build a studio um, around children, uh, teaching children primarily. She had worked for a larger conservatory. She had loved the children's programs that she had worked with there in another city. And she, now she had come to where she wanted to live and wanted to start her own thing. And she came into the coaching relationship with, a, with an idea of, I need to build this school in this particular suburb um, because mm -hmm. I have a high degree of familiarity with that suburb and, and this sort of thing. And I came in and on our very first call, I had already done some pre-planning. I'd had her fill out kind of an intake form and actually stick around everyone because I'm going to tell you a little bit some of these secret coaching tools I use towards the end of the call here um, and, and kind of give you a little bit of a, a leg up maybe on solving some of your business challenges. I'm, I'm going to actually give you some of the questions that I asked this particular person that I think you'll see in the course of the story how helpful this was, but don't want to interrupt myself. Um, so she had, she had told me everything she wanted to create. She had told me the plan, all these sorts of things. I had done some pre-planning and I came in there and in the course of listening to her, I, I kept noticing something, how she was talking about the suburbs as where the kids are at. And then she also in that same call was already dreading the commute, the hour commute that she was gonna have to do four or five days a week to get this school off the ground. Now, if you're a consultant or a, a coach that focuses more around teaching, you might, okay, here's how you do a business plan. Here's how you do marketing. Here's how you get your systems, in, okay? But I was already detecting some competing commitments in her language. And so I said to her, I'm not gonna say her name, obviously. I said, hey, can you tell me why you wanna do it in the suburb? Did you like grow up there? And she told me her whole reason and it all came out there because she hadn't said this yet, but her vision was, oh, there's no, like I live in a super trendy part of San Francisco. There's no kids here. So I have to do it out there. And so then I started asking her about, um, it seems like you're not too crazy about this commute. Have you thought about doing an adult lesson studio? And we talked about that for a little while. And I mean, in the grand scheme of the call, we hadn't gotten anywhere yet. She was no closer to starting that studio out in the suburbs than we were at the beginning of the call. Because all I was asking her was a bunch of questions about what she was thinking. And then it hit me. And this is where it becomes practical. Because I said, how many kids actually live in your zip code? Hmm. And she said, I have no idea. <laughs> so in that call, we literally got on the US census site. And we discovered that the three zip codes around her and the three zip codes in the suburbs had roughly the same number of children in them. <laughs> and she changed her entire business plan in our first coaching call together. And she now has a teaching studio in downtown San Francisco that primarily sees kids. That is good coaching that goes beyond just teaching. And, and I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. if anything, I owe everything to Dave because I spent a long time with that guy learning how to coach the way that he did. Um, and that got passed on from some really incredible coaches that he had worked with. Um, yes. And so, you know, I think that's the distinction. Of course, coaching can include teaching. Sometimes it has to, but I'd say that, um, and maybe I'm stealing a little bit from the future here, but I'd say that many times for it to be great coaching, it has to go beyond that. Okay, I'm gonna shut up now. Alyssa, <laughs> let me ask you the question. Um, um, is there, is there anything that strikes you about the question, uh, what is coaching not, or, or maybe we should just move on to what good coaching is. I'm, I'm curious if you'd prefer to move on or if you, if you maybe want to dwell on this a little bit more. You know, I think as you were talking, one thing that became hmm. really clear for me and what good coaching is, is the ability of someone to ask the right questions. Hmm. And I, I think your ability to ask her how many kids are in this neighborhood here or there, right? Uh, you know, leading her on a journey of exploration in the right direction 
that's curated, but still she's the one answering um, the questions in her own way. Uh, I think it's, that's the sign of a good coach, right? And I believe the, um, the lineage of coaches that we all have been uh, privileged to work with both good and bad uh, mm. are, are again, are again, they establish the quality of the questions we learn to ask, right, as coaches. Mm. And so we carry on this ability to take a 30,000 foot view of a situation and of a person and very objectively say, you know, well, what about this over here? What about this over here? And it just help people to reorient to possibilities, right? So I believe that's the value of a great coach and, and hmm. the, the value of the coaches is, is directly correlated to their ability to ask the right questions. Yeah. Now, I know that at Musicians Playground that you view the teachers more yes. as coaches. Yes. And, and that is the culture that you created there. I'd love for you to maybe go into a little bit more detail about um, you know, some of the unique things that you have going on. I think this probably is a good segue into what great coaching is. Um, yeah. Maybe give me a, an idea of how you've, I know you've worked with folks in, as a business coach, but I, I know you're also training musical coaches for these premium programs that adults in Boston are paying a really good amount of money to be involved in. So I'm going to leave this really broad and open-ended, but um, maybe tell me how that idea you just mentioned there kind of plays out in terms of how you're teaching your coaches or coaching your coaches to do, or maybe you take in a different direction. I don't know. Um, what comes to mind when I say that? Yeah. So I'm going to try not to go off on too big of a tangent. Oh, man. I could, I, I could I write a really dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm so passionate about the teacher training program we've implemented here at MP and the work that I do on, a, on the ground level with the people that I might, that I work directly with my staff and it's about 20 now of, of teachers and interns and volunteers and, and, and just so many wonderful, gifted, talented musicians and thinkers and coaches. And mm. we hire for coaches and we prepare them to be great coaches. And there's a difference, I believe, between a coach and a teacher, which is my teachers are not instructed to, teachers are not instructed to follow a curriculum. Hmm. We have a few suggested curriculums, for example, but I would equate a teacher in the ordinary sense to be someone who a client comes through the door and they immediately have a book and they place it in front of that client and they say, start here and we're gonna end here, right? Hmm. Without any regard to that person's goals or fuller sense of self versus the processes that we've implemented at Musicians Playgrounds are extensive discovery calls prior to accepting anyone into our community, uh, coaches getting questionnaires from our clients on their goals, their deeper motivations for learning. You know, we often get told, oh, I want to learn this song. But if you do a little bit of deeper digging, you find out that this person actually works a really high powered job, they're perfectionists and they could really benefit from learning improv improvisational styles of music, not mm. classical, right? So when you do some digging, you can kind of gather a sense of that whole person and maybe they tell you something as, as, as simple as I wanna learn this song in which a teacher would just put that song in front of them and begin the work. But a coach gets to know that whole person and then makes, uh, it takes the discretion of making a decision as to whether that song is actually going to be the right choice for their greater motivations, their greater goals. Oh. So our teachers have in their peripheral uh, teachers, I, again, we call them coaches, but I think that might confuse people who are listening. Our teachers sure. are, are instructed to take into account the whole human. And we actually have a variety of programming models for the, the different types of people that we come across, different types of clients we serve. So the way in which they approach the problem solving process can change based on the people that are walking through our door. And I believe that that's a signal of a coach versus a teacher of hmm. a school that, that prioritizes coaching versus teaching is that we consider again, the client's greater motivations goals. And we serve as that chief strategy officer of the direction in which they move 
helping them accomplish their goals, but also accomplish so many more other goals that they may not have thought were important to them that only that coach would know is. So. So what's interesting is that a lot of studios who are maybe a little bit lazy in their marketing, um, not you, obviously, <laughs> this is where I'm getting to, <laughs> might say, oh, we create a custom plan for you. This is a very, this is very common language. It's easy yeah. just to slap that up on your website. We create a custom plan for you. And what that looks like is in the first, you know, lesson, hey, you know, what songs do you like? Oh, I like, uh, I like Taylor Swift and, you know, I like some Hall and Oates and great. <laughs> We'll, we'll learn those songs and that's their custom plan. What it sounds like you created goes a lot deeper than just asking some simple questions and maybe finding out if the person likes pop rock or jazz, you know? Um, it sounds like there's some deeper things going on there, probably even in how you're training your teacher coaches to do their job. And I'm curious, maybe you could go into that a little bit more. Yeah, so... Um... <laughs> So our, uh, I'm just without, like without going so for much. two hours, I know when people, okay. I, I, when people ask me, Daniel, how do you teach multi-level groups? What do I tell them on like a 10 minute call? Like it takes me six hours to explain how I made that happen in my, in my own studio. Like that's why I have a whole training yes. about it. Um, so yes. I realize that's a huge question, but maybe you can hit the highlights. Yeah. So, um, okay. So we actually have a diagnostic tool of which our, our teachers are trained to listen for certain information and diagnose the type of, of client that they're working with based on that information. Once they diagnose the type of client, uh, then they that automatically generates a suggested programming model for that coach to follow. And what it consists of is a balance of uh, focuses for the hours time. So I'll give you an example. Um, mm. So it would it would be, let's say we have a working professional. By the way, Musicians Playground is very much uh, dominated by uh, working professionals. We, we cater and specialize in, in teaching adult hobbyists. Yes, we serve a lot of happy uh, kids, but we really make a, 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 an effort, a concerted yeah. effort around marketing toward adults. So let's say we're, we have a working professional who's doing music lessons outside of their job and they come in and they're working a very high powered position, probably not going to practice a whole lot. They're doing this for fun. They're here to maybe be able to learn and play their favorite songs and potentially to make some new connections and friends in the community. So that's someone we would call the weekend warrior at Musicians Playground. And the, the teacher would have a diagnostic tool that would tell them that information based off of their answers to some of these questions and then would prescribe to them uh, a more repertoire focused approach for teaching them. Meaning the teacher is not gonna put them through a ton of scales and Hannon and Cherney and all these classics, right? We're gonna try to get them more directly to their goals because we know that our time, their time making music is limited, much more limited than what we would call a serious hobbyist. Uh, so with that, the programming model serves as just a way that our coaches can conceptualize the time that they're gonna spend with their client and make the most meaningful, uh, make the most meaningful experience for their client. Um, but that's again why they're they're coaches and not teachers. And I think a lot of times we we as musicians or our music teachers come from the way we know how to teach music, and we pres we prescribe to one specific curriculum or maybe two, and that's what we do. And we we try to keep it very simple and straightforward. But that's being a teacher and not a coach to bring it back to the original conversation. So, I. I don't know, Daniel, probably that got really abstract and maybe at the risk of being unhelpful for some of the listeners, but it's probably interesting at the very least for people to know that you can get that granular at typing the people that you serve, but also still keep an abstract enough framework for uh, providing um, coaching or teaching for the people that you're working with. You know, it's interesting over the past few years, I've had different people that I've had conversation with, interview with, and almost always after that this person people start reaching out to them like hey you know tell me how do you do what you do this sort of thing and of course <laughs> you've spent most of your adult life designing this it's not yeah. something you learn in you know a weekend um <laughs> but what started you on this path and maybe what's something practical that someone could do if they wanted to move down that pathway if they wanted to offer something that was more 
that respected who the entire person was versus just, hey, we're, we're, we're putting butts in seats, you know? Yeah, yeah, great question. So the first thing, and this I learned this, by the way, from the spiritual psychologist that I worked Interesting. with. Interesting. She and I got in a conversation about uh, sales and then that turned into, well, how am I utilizing the sales process to serve people on this holistic level? If I preach that I'm doing it, how am I doing it or not doing it throughout the entirety of the business? And so one thing I would suggest on a very practical level that I learned from her for some of our listeners is to go above and beyond the normal questions that we ask in, a, in the beginning meeting, consultation, however someone wants to call it, solutions call, discovery call. Uh, I would also, for me at least, I, I went away from offering a free lesson or I went to just making it a consultation where I gathered a lot of data before jumping in and working with somebody. That data, I dared to drive deeper beyond just what's your favorite song. Yes, that's a question we'll ask, like what would you like to learn in your, or what would you like to focus on in your very first learning experience? But we asked very specific questions, like what's your deeper motivation for learning music? What do you feel you could benefit from, from having music in your life? Like how can music positively affect other aspects of your life, right? So we tried to prime their thinking into uh, a more holistic perspective prior to them even engaging with our brand. And yeah, we'll, I'll, we'll get those people who are a little bit uh, less open or willing to go to those mm. levels with us. But you know, what's funny is the ones that do are the ones that stick around for the longest. And then the ones that aren't willing to go there are probably not as clear on the greater benefits that music will serve them. Thus, we may not even uh, be able to serve them to the greatest capacity because they don't know what they want from it. So, um, so it's interesting. I would just encourage uh, the sales calls to be the place where people start this work of finding out what really matters to the people they're serving and just collect the data, see what the answers are for, for some of those more open people they're on the sales calls with, see what they say and, and look at patterns. That's not only going to help them with marketing language and to uh, get better at what they're going to offer in terms of services and programs, but it's going to help them to transform the experience they provide their clients. We're coming full circle here <laughs> because what you just said, um, and you know, I, I just have to go here because what, what you were saying, I so totally agree with. And what the common feedback I get from most music studio owners, especially of smaller and mid-sized studios, is that they're afraid to have those conversations. They don't want to have those conversations. One of the first things in one of our marketing trainings, our, our high-level marketing training that I have people do, and this isn't a secret, this was actually one of the first blog posts I ever wrote in 2016. One of the first things I have people do is actually do an internal survey of their studio. And I give a lot of tips on how to make this work, what questions to ask, and more importantly, what to do with the data. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody is afraid to ask those questions. And, and this is getting back to how we started this conversation, that we all know we should be doing this stuff. What's actually preventing us from doing it? And for most people, it's either fear or two, they wouldn't know what to do with the data if they got it. <laughs> and yeah, this is my true. observation. I'm not trying to be cynical or jaded, but that's it. And I think this could be a good place for us to kind of draw to a close here. And, and that is, I made a promise at the, at the beginning um, uh, about uh, uh, giving a little bit of a framework that I use when I'm considering working with someone. Mm. Um, and so I'm going to kind of just give the framework here. Alyssa, if you want me to detail anything, if I'm being too abstract, let me know. Maybe you want to jump in and say, hey, you know, if it were me, I would do, I would ask this question, that sort of thing. But basically it's this, it's pretty simple. I urge people to get very clear on five to 10 specific things that they want to achieve by being coached by someone. Hmm. Then I ask them to list out, and, and here's why I'm giving this, because anybody can do this. And the reason why I'm giving this, and it's not a secret, so to speak, is that a lot of times, most people, they go through this process, they've never done this before, or they didn't take it seriously, potentially. Um, and just answering it in of itself was a value to them, let alone actually working on it with me. So mm -hmm. again, to get back, I interrupted myself again, but <laughs> five to 10 goals. What are the things that you feel are preventing you from getting to those goals? What are those actual obstacles? Um, and then the final thing to write down is if 
you solve those five to 10 things, mm -hmm. uh, that could take years. Out of those five to 10, what, what is the number one thing that you probably, you probably know you should be working on most of all? Either it's causing you a lot of stress or you know it is such a huge win out of that list of five to 10 things that you want changed. Because here's what people come back to me. Oh, I need to, all, <laughs> I need to update my policies. Yeah. I'm sorry, updating <laughs> your policies isn't gonna change your business. That might yeah. be on the list. And, and even there, that kind of reveals an inability to, uh, to prioritize, which again, in working with a lot of clients, I've kind of seen that to be true, but what it would be a bit on that, which one is causing you loads of stress? Um, which one would be a huge windfall if, you're, if you solve that problem? Those sorts of right. things. And also, which one is most transferable or far reaching to all of them, right? I think it's whatever one is the highest level solution that by solving it, it would have trace effects of solving the rest of them. That's, that's a, a good oh one. My word, on. yes, yes, <laughs> you're so right. Cause here's what I would do. When I worked with Dave throughout the week, I would write down frustrations. I would write down negative thoughts I was having. I would write down mm. dark thoughts that I was having and then I would email them to, to uh, my task management system. And then the night before I would have my coaching call, I would literally go in and look at all this stuff and I would prioritize it. This is the homework I would do to make sure I got the most out of my coaching call. And this is what I tell my clients to do as well. And there were some things, so I would prioritize it. And invariably in the conversation that I had with him, we, I would have like 20 things and we would get to the first two maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would just leave those in there. I'd delete the two that we worked on. And then I would do the same exercise the next week. I'd come back the next week. I'd look at everything. I'd prioritize again. Some things never moved to the top. But here's what happened over time. As I kept focusing on those high level things, those things that were at the bottom got deleted because they solved themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I love that. I love that. And the other thing I wanted to say about this was that, oh, I, I, just, I think I just lost it. It had to do with what you said as well, was that. The, oh, the transferability. Sometimes I've literally had to help my clients even know what their highest priority is. And again, yes. this just get this, this is a deeper level of coaching where I can't know until I listen. I can't know what that is. And until, uh, and until go, you, you have the experience, until you have the experience yourself, until you have learned from others, like, you know, it's, there's a whole conglomerate of things that make us more able to prioritize yes. better, more efficiently than someone who has had half as much time exercising what we've done or has worked with half as many people as we've worked with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. So that, that's my secret technique. And again, just like Dave telling me, yeah, just go do three videos a week for the next quarter on paper. That seems really simple. It's what Gary Vaynerchuk's been yelling for like five years, but I never listened to Gary. <laughs> it took Dave getting into my head and, and figuring out what was going on that was preventing me from actually doing this yeah. for me, you know, to make a meaningful change and for my actions to actually change. And the outcome of me actually doing that was from the time that I did that on, the mm -hmm. number over the next six months, the number of leads that Grow got for our marketing programs and our group lesson programs literally quadrupled from what it had been the previous year. I knew that it was important that I did it. And I just, for two straight years, I did nothing with that knowledge. And then I finally did. Mm. And it took Dave to get me unstuck. It's pretty cool. I love it. Yeah. So again, the secret technique, write down those five to 10 goals, then X out about seven of them. <laughs> If you need a coach to help you figure out which seven to X out, that's something a good coach can do for you as well. Write down the obstacles that you feel are in your way to achieving those one to three really high level goals, and then get really clear on the ROI and the outcome you want to see from actually having done that. And a good coach can take that information and maybe even tell you like, you know what, I think I, think I see what you're trying to get at here, but you might not be going about it in the best way. Or yeah. maybe you are, and maybe let's go to work on those obstacles. So I don't know. I think I'll end there, Alyssa. Any last thoughts you have about any of the topics we talked about today, just in terms of coaching or, um, yeah, I'll just volley it back over to you one more time. Sorry to put you on the spot there. 
No, no, I think, I think I feel complete other than I would just caution that, uh, finding a coach and do in, in, and establishing a relationship with a coach should only be done when there's a real willingness to do the work because it's difficult sometimes mm. to, to go to those places that we need to go to in order to be better versions of ourselves. And it really takes the right mindset from the very outset to engage and utilize the maximum potential of the coach, any coach that anybody listening engages with. So I would just encourage, I would just encourage people to go in fully spirited and open to the possibilities and willing to do the work to get the most out of their experience with whoever they engage. Yes. You, oh man, we could probably do a whole hour on this. <laughs> and I, and I have to say this because I have to say this before we sign off because what you're talking about there, so many in that internal customer survey, so many, not so many, but a good number of people said they wanted a coach for motivation. Hmm. So I have, a, I have a thought. Did Michael Jordan have a coach for motivation? No, he had a coach to push him, but there was already that fire in there. And there was this documentary that came out last year called The Last Dance. I talk about it all the time. That guy was <laughs> nuts. He had, the and, and there's so many, I think, athletes. And you talk about how Musicians Playground kind of takes that you know, yes. almost like a gym model in terms of how you think of coaching. But so many of the greatest athletes of the last 20, 30, 40 years, all their teammates would say like, oh, they were horrible to be around, but they made us better. Yeah. And they just had something going on. And I think of, you know, a Tom Brady, um, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Peyton Manning, like different sports figures that I've really appreciated and just how they were the first one there. They were the last one to leave that motivation was there. And I completely agree with you. I think there are some motivation coaches. There are some accountability coaches. That is not the kind of coach I am. I don't think it's the kind of coach that you are. You're looking for people who uh, already have maybe. Okay. It's fair. It's fair. I, a, li a little more. I'll be honest. If we're being fully honest, I think that I personally respond well to um, but my, I think love languages, this is a whole nother, you know, talk because I believe the five love languages, if anyone's listening and has not read the five love languages, I encourage people to do that right away. Uh, it depends on how we receive love. And I think when we feel loved, we feel, I think also more motivated, more uh, mm. vibing, happy vibing, right? Like, so for me, a coach that spends time saying, Alyssa, you're kicking ass, like you're doing awesome. That, that for me mm. is a source of even a, an even greater fire. So I think it comes down to knowing ourselves and if the person we're working with is not that person, to just be okay with that and understand that and, and accept them for who they are because they probably are offering a whole host of other benefits. But if that's really important, then you wanna find someone who that's a natural part of the way that they offer they offer love to the people that they're working with. So teach your own, I would yeah. say that. <laughs> I, I might modify what I had to say then because I do tend to talk in extreme sometimes. I do think there is a continuum between you know, some of our lower level coaching programs or like even just self-directed marketing coaching programs. Um, I do put motivation there when I'm doing like premium coaching. I think that's where um, I'm looking for someone who already has that fire inside. Um, so I think it exists in a continuum. And of course, it's one of my bad habits. I talk in extremes. So thanks for calling that out. That's great. <laughs> thanks for the good. Thanks for the coaching, Alyssa. I appreciate that. <laughs> So I think um, I want to cut it there uh, because we've been going on for quite some time and um, yeah. I, I hope this has been helpful for folks. Obviously, if you have a question, put it in wherever you're watching this, put it in the comments below. Want to challenge something we said, put it in the comments below. If there was something that was um, really helpful, I'd love to know what that was. And uh, we might do another one of these conversations again soon and, and maybe jump in on, uh, on a different topic around this. Yeah. Anyway, thanks, Alyssa. Thank you so much, Daniel, and for everybody who watched. It was such a pleasure.